Earlier this week, I met uh, with 150 third and fourth graders, and it was a lot of fun about poetry. But it made me think of two things: one, that children appear very often in my in my poems, and also that the children that appear in my poems have very little to do with the children in real life. <laughs> so I thought today I'd read poems that have children in them, and I'll read seven poems. Uh, this this first poem is a relatively new one, and. It starts with the expression, and then, you know, when you're telling a kid a story, is it, and then, and then. So it's about, it starts with that, and it has a subtitle of The Value of Yet to Come. And then, at times this brings a stork, past rains, alighting on a tower, at times a bubble bursting on a pond. I hear, and then, and see a fern or a feather, the first one wild and wispy to cure a wound, the roll of ancient grasses. The other, trade of a bird, slim fan or jewel purse, the kind fairy tales gather. Is there a child, young heir of things apparent, who will not ask what every storyline will tell, which words carry their end with candor? Secrets would hunker down, safe in their winter castles, were it not for this recurring notion that a stalk, weighty with beans, will ride a pole for air, that a pea, twelve pillows down, will tease a girl awake, that our skin, stretched thin to dress our needs, will raise deep, eager tales, and that the child, the child who plays beneath my desk, a paper box in hand, will look askance and then she'll breathe aloft the lid. Um, you know, there are fairy tales there that I think we recognized. Uh, but, but who is this child? Sometimes I think to myself, sometimes I think to somebody else, but um, I had a brother who died as a baby, and his name was Antonito, and uh, he's very much alive in our family. His presence continues. He would be 50-something years old today, but he's always been there. And I wrote this poem, it's in a Commerce of Moments, which I never have read at a reading. I thought I'd read it today for him. And um, uh, two months appear in the poem. One is March, he died in March. The other one is November. And November is a very special month in our family. My father's birth is in November, his death was in November, they were married in November. And the time between March and November is nine months, which is very much a time making a new life. Um, so this is the doorway. The doors lift a ribbon of March winds underfoot, where Mama stood, where the child was no longer dust in the teak box, but a bright knob of reference, nagging wind song of a crack, wood shavings, and the aroma of a closed crib, like sweet pine bark scented her yard's crocus. Spring comes as a season ajar, with access to both spaces, balconies from which we look. There, coaxed into and out of living, we must number and draw, juggle toys, work out puzzles to define abide, anticipate, expect, limp out of longing. Near us, hinges burn with light on their backbones, and the door hums. Saffron blooms for two weeks in the fall. We know the soil before it, the soil after it, the small wound on which its purple clumps withers. The flower leaves a subdued scar for the next blossom. Ah, the door swings fully in November when the child, dusty and deliberate, climbs over the rail. His small hands scoop and love, nothing more. Um, I wrote this poem shortly after my father died, and I did have a dream where, where I was in one room and there was a balcony outside, and my father was in the balcony. Um, I, we have had to imagine my brother's life uh, and uh, cobble it together from experiences, and I, and I do that <coughs> a lot. Mm -hmm. I think of people not as they are today, but as a cumulus of what they have been all their life, and I look at, so be careful, because I look at you and I look at the child. <laughs> And I have to imagine that. So this one is my grandmother. She was a storyteller in the family. She told 
stories about all the members of my family, but she became sort of a larger than life figure for us. She was actually, um, had polio as a child and didn't, and limped. So this poem is called Lola's Window. She often sat at the window, so the beginning of the scene is her sitting at the window and praying her rosary. But it goes back and I imagine her as a child with her limp. And there are two words that appear here, um, Sipa and Patintero, which are games that Filipino children play. Um, so it's called Lola's Window. Lola is um, the word we use in Filipino for grandmother. Uh, I know that here is Lola, and Lola, but it's a woman's name. The call to make believe later forbidden, a liturgy of ghosts. Every night she settled near the window, <coughs> rosary and wrinkle on the wood. The moon dimpled to zero on her lap, remade eclipsed, hair lip of a sun's invasion. And in that shade, cool and somnolent, her memory grew certain. Once she was a child in a resplendent room, hoping for an annunciation, drive of wings down and inward, ballet in the rattle of a blind. There she'd hear an angel's liquid claim, sold with sweet treasure. Come, where the brilliance is yours, come and carry off my cry. Released at last of all painstaking growth, of hands out of jackstones and sepa, out of the box like patintero she could not play, not being swift enough. Only the god in her white room, this you will do and only this, for your patio of light. Midnight dropped its pearl under her eaves, nugget of those years when the, wound when the moon never reached. Loss is an old but an ample word for ghost. Prize is a better word for angel. Um, the more children appear in my poems, the more I realize, as I said earlier, that they have sometimes little to do with real children. They're archetypes. And uh, I realized that they were archetypes. And not too long ago, I, I wrote a poem. I, I wanted these children to come out of the woodwork, come out from being archetypes and be real. So this poem is called Archetypes. It's also that I didn't hear it was published, but not in a manuscript, not in a book manuscript. Uh, and I even gave one of the children a name, Carlos, and the girl is Elena. And this is about these children that keep coming into my poems and that have no real life, or maybe they do. Archetypes. They never wear, they always are. These children who run heaven in our midst, who populate our parks, who lose their daily grip on graveyard walks, but find it in the gravel of their shoes. We are far stronger than you are, they say. We are alive and you are not. I never met them, but I always knew the yellow moths that brush against their cheeks. You've heard me say Elena for a girl and Carlos for the anonymous young boy. They run home, so the rule says when it rains. They rush off, so my eyes fear when it storms. They play, I'm pausing, with a village brood, where children seem less clear, less separate. I never met them, but I always knew about the notes they their oyster pockets hold. What do they say? How do they pick the words? I'm sure that Carlos writes his in a haste, he of the archetypal kind who lift a sword without excessive qualm, but who remains a child before the dark. When shall I draw them out, free from the woods, he and Elena and all the others fresh from myth? When will their muddy feet, heard two by two, turn to the open air of Burnley Street? That day, they'll seize their darting in and out. They'll come in pairs or in halves, as humans do. They live in houses, light their fires, and read about the young who learn from them to be. Um, again, there's the children but, and the young, but as I get older, I find the children also get older. <laughs> and, uh, and older people can also be my children. <laughs> so so this, this, um, this poem is about a soldier coming home. We always talk about them as our boys. And so um, I, I wrote this poem, which was published in a magazine called War Literature and the Arts. And then it's also in Art, uh, Love in the Afterlife, and um, it's about a soldier who's come home. 
and its golden, oh vivifying bones. For all that's well and done, a mask might mar his peace, though nothing should it be but hope of pure fine faces. For all he understood, a backyard beckons new, a host of it the woods, then silvery eruptions of incendiary seeds, from there to grow a flower, a flame dispensing vine whose stems still speak of spears and the return of warriors. For all the prayers he said, the field attrition ceased, the trenches veered to truce, and in the truce he worshipped as a child who's made of earth. For all that's kept unsaid, at last he is coming home to a fresh race, fresh hill, fresh tilled hillock, stepping with barefoot toes, stepping with fears of crushing, oh, vivifying bones, one boy to every abode over the crimson mountains. Um, we often hear this, that children are our poems, and I said that myself. Um, but they really are not. It's very different to have a child, to have a poem. And uh, years ago, I was with some friends and relatives in a garden, a yard, a big yard, and there, there were all mothers with their children playing in the yard. And I was sitting there, and, and they were talking about how full their days were and all the things they did. And then one of them looked at me and said, and what do you do? How do you spend your days? I, uh, I, I, I said, writing, and felt very insufficient. <laughs> uh, and mm, after that, I, I wrote a poem called A Might Be Summer, and it's in Full Into Ashes. Another serving, please, of days we left, and nature comes around, blonde, mother-like. Morays the table slowly with a cloth, hesitates at the doorway. Another scoop of things that someone said dazzling with what might be, was not. The rich tan of an afternoon, the solid air still smoldering, the yellow cake with icing in our thumbs to eat away bright, <coughs> brightly. And no one knows how so August crisps jinxes the, jinxes the roots of hair, a pungent amber. How do you spend your day, they ask years later, and everywhere the word hangs, hangs between. Writing, I say. A dozen birdhouses descend under their trees, all different, with gargoyles, needling sparse, white lattice wood to eucalyptus. They, I'm sorry, white lattice wood. They dance to eucalyptus. A dozen children play around the rocks. This only I and anyone regret, eventually. Are flat words insufficient in the morning? our dry aprons intact, the smell of resurrection crusting. Little hands scuttle away from unacquainted pockets. I feel them now, late evening after poems, confessing only a part. A child is what she is, not the day, nor the doubt my word careens against. There I go now, forgetting. And uh, as um, this is the last poem, as as the poem show, and as I realized, uh, the word child means different things, children, different things. And which brings to light the power of poetry, not only to define, but to suggest, which is what I love most about it. Every word suggests something else. So this last poem is about that, and it's called Last Child, Last Child. And it's not last child, but last period, child period. Each of those words will suggest something <coughs> different, a different world to each one of us. Um, so this is the poem called Last Child, Last Child. We do not speak in tongues or hold seances, hands on a table, ear to a distant hymn, as if our ghosts were nimble advocates of speech. Away from trances, we believe in the close-knit village of our voices, Rarely believe in voices we can't hear. A word depends on impulses, air catch, air lease, that hold its meaning hostage. Language, like the dawn, is the defeat of hours and a second's gain. To look at new geraniums and say timelessly, pink thumbs, two words, 
that leave the womb as flowers. It is to hear inadequately words like last and child in thread of twilight. Say it again, please. Last, child, last, child, while a judgment rides home to its homecoming. Shouldn't we ask who and why, the plot and the denouement, the ache for ends? One child's asleep now, the other is fitfully awake.